good afternoon. Uh, I'm Representative Ann Pugh, Chair of House Human Services um, in Vermont. This is Tuesday, April 7th, and we are um, meeting. Um, and the first person that we have um, on our agenda is Chris Herrick from Emergency Management. Um, and we're really talking about COVID-19 updates and where we're going. Um, Chris, before we start, um, I thought that it would be helpful if the committee introduced themselves. Um, Nolan, representative. Uh, Logan Nicole, representative from Ludlow, representing Mount Holly and Shrewsbury. I'm Mary Beth Redmond, I represent Essex. Carl Rosenquist, I represent the town of Georgia. Jessica Bremstead, and I represent Shelburne and St. George. Sandy Haas, I represent Rochester, Bethel, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield. Uh, James Gregoire, I represent Fairfield, Fletcher, and Bakersfield. Uh, Dan Noyes, represent Wilkett, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Belvedere. I guess we're going a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa? Okay, I wasn't sure if Kelly was going to go or if I should. Okay. I don't know uh, what just happened there. <laughs> I heard a silence. Wood. I didn't know. Uh, Teresa Wood uh, representing uh, Waterbury, Bolton, Beals, Gore, and Huntington. <laughs> Kelly Payala representing, <laughs> Kelly Payala representing Londonderry, Weston, Stratton, Windhall, and Jamaica. Oh, thank you. And and Topper just texted me. He's waiting to be let into the meeting. He's coming in now. There he is. Hi, Topper. Topper, can you introduce yourself to folks? <clears throat> Chris, we're almost there. Okay. Um, Topper, are you on? Well, um, Chris, the, the 11th member of our committee is Representative Topper McFawn from Barrytown. Um, Thank you, Chris, for um, coming to committee from the confines of your house. <laughs> I'm actually in my office right now. Oh, well. Well, um, please, um, please start. And can you explain to the committee what your role is and sure. what the um, update is in terms of <laughs> how the emergency management office is working? I can. And so for the record, I'm Christopher Harris. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, uh, Chris, we can't hear you. Not at all? Now we can. Okay. For the record, I'm Christopher Herrick. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. Emergency management is a function within public safety, just like April Reed. Chris, you're going to have to speak really loudly. Okay. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Yep. I see heads nodding. Um, so I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety, um, of which Vermont Emergency Management is a function. Um, as part of, uh, as Sandy, are you not able to hear me? You keep going in and out. Um, is there a phone if I can call in maybe? I, I think um, just this is just my two cents. I think if you were to like Uber project into your and get close to your laptop, I think we could hear you, but it, it seems to fade down. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. That's good. Okay, there's a different microphone setting. Um, all right, so how's this? Perfect. Okay, so um, Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety of which Vermont Emergency Management is a part. Um, the other parts are state police, the Division of Fire Safety, and uh, the Forensics Lab, Vermont Criminal Information Center, um, that, yeah, that covers it. So 
My role is um, I have been the EOC manager on a number of occasions here. And the, the biggest charge that I'm leading right now is coordinating with AHS on the medical surge component of uh, planning for the COVID-19 um, impact in Vermont. What that means is, is we're working directly with all the hospitals, the Department of Health, um, groups um, serviced by uh, the Agency of Human Services, such as uh, homeless folk, um, folks in DCF custody, the DOC, um, in long-term care facilities. We, we've been working specifically and, and we've been working on this for about four weeks, um, almost nonstop on the hospital's plan to surge internally. And then there's a point where they might become overwhelmed. If you look at the modeling that's been put out, um, the great work by Commissioner Pichek, you'll see that uh, the worst case scenario is pretty significant and would overwhelm uh, the medical system's capability in short order. Um, but due to um, the mitigation efforts uh, that Vermonters are really doing a great job at complying with, we've seen a real um, flattening of the curve I know that's a term everybody's sick of hearing, but it's really super important in the planning process. And um, we, we could be very close in terms of bed capability, capability, ventilator capability, based on the number of folks um, that are in at any given time. But we're planning for the worst, hoping for the best. And planning for the worst means uh, like I said, the hospitals have been working to increase their internal ability to surge. Um, we've also opened up two regional um, surge, med surge sites, one at the Essex Fairgrounds, um, and we're utilizing National Guard assets for that. And that is a 400 bed um, facility with the ability down the road, if we have to, to isolate 50 uh, non-acute COVID-19 positive patients. The other site is the Spartan Arena in, in Rutland. And that's originally up at 150 beds. And that's being staffed by folks from the Rutland Regional Hospital. Both should be ready, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they'll have patience. We also have uh, opened up a site at the Barry Auditorium, which I'm sure Topper is familiar with. And we've also opened one at the Collins Pearly uh, Sports Center. Each one of those is to accommodate 50. Um, but those are not going to be staffed immediately. And if they are, the hospitals will, will need to staff it. Um, but hopefully we won't get to that point. The third site that's imp important to note that's open is uh, at uh, fifth site, I should say, is at Patrick Gymnasium. And that's opened uh, with assistance from the Vermont National Guard, but is being staffed up when needed by uh, UVM Medical Center staff. And it's designated as a COVID positive um, treatment area for non-acute patients. Then if those folks, any of those folks need to be hospitalized, they will bring them into the hospital proper. So that's-, so, that's I'm sorry, uh, can you explain the difference between what is going to be proposed for Patrick Jim versus the other four places that you were talking about in terms of who's going to be there and what need are you addressing? So the need, the need there is if, so the other sites that we talked, mainly Essex and Rutland are what for decompression of hospitals. So they can move folks who um, don't need high level of medical care. That way we can use the hospital space for patients who may have COVID-19. 
Met, the Patrick Jim is going to be for folks who may have who have COVID-19 but aren't requiring a high level of medical care at that time and they can go in there receive treatment and as they recover um, they can move out. If they need higher level of medical treatment then they'll be moved in. That's being staffed by medical center personnel. Did that clarify? Yes, thank you. Okay. So along with that is a number of other factors that we have to consider, such as how do we feed the patient, uh, laundry services, cleaning, all the logistics that need to go along with that. Um, there's also uh, the component of moving patients around the state to, to the regional sites or to other hospitals. And um, the hospitals generally do this on a daily basis. The UVM Medical Center and Dartmouth-Hitchcock coordinate patient transfer on a daily basis, and they are going to do that uh, through this as well. So if there's a swell of folks in one area, we'll be able to move them. And so we're working with the hospitals on developing a transportation plan as well. Um, they can handle it for the most part, but if they get overwhelmed, we will have a transportation unit to assist them in and moving folks from where they are to where they've been identified would be best for, um, for the patient. In addition, we will be supporting the movement of ventilators. We've been ordering ventilators um, like crazy, uh, pardon the expression. Um, anytime we can find any that would be deliverable in the time frame needed, uh, we've been ordering them in consultation with experts at the UVM Medical Center. We've been ordering PPE from any source where we can, uh, and we keep a daily count of what we have available at the warehouse. And those are being shipped out to medical facilities as a priority, and then first responders um, next. And so we're constantly trying to resupply that. So Chris- Is there a question? Yeah, Chris, what is, or who is considered a medical provider? Is it the hospitals or where do um, long-term care facilities, residential facilities fit in, in terms of those? And then, um, so they're also can... able to request, um, and I don't have the algorithm, so being supplied with equipment, uh, PPE, uh, because we recognize um, the need to protect folks who may be in um, home care or in a long-term care facility. Uh, well, we've already seen what can happen. And so uh, they're also um, being supplied with PPE through the request channels that I mentioned That's earlier. So are they, they have to do this by request or are they- Everybody. Everyone does Everybody. it by request? Yes, ma'am. And- in the list, in the prioritizing, so home care people are are within the top group as well. Are you saying? I, be I believe they are. I don't have. I we don't manage that out of the EOC. That's handled by um, um, over at the health department and the health operations center. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So, so go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I apologize for interrupting your train of no, thought. No, it's okay. Um, the, uh, I should tell you at the front end of this that the State Emergency Operations Center is fully activated, um, but today there are only two or three of us actually in the building. We, we are having the State Emergency Operations Center operate remotely uh, because we're concerned about our folks as well. Um, one of the things that we're concerned about going forward is staffing um, because the, the virus could affect staffing levels in all, all sectors. And so uh, the governor has directed the development of a website to recruit volunteers. And if you, the landing page for that has two buttons. One takes you to the MRC, the Medical Reserve Corps, the other one is much is a much more general page for 
folks that wouldn't necessarily go to the MRC, like nurses and doctors. So we might we might have a need for drivers. We might have a need for firefighters. Um, and so those are being aggregated in a database. Uh, we'll be working through the EOC to help respond to requests for those kind of assets. And the MRC will be working to uh, address staffing requests that come from perhaps medical facilities um, or home health care or other um, um, facilities like that. So I've said an awful lot. I, I can probably pause and let folks ask questions. Okay, perfect. Because I'm sure we have some. Um, committee. Um, Does anyone have um, a question at this point? I do. Okay. I do. Um, so I'm, you, you mentioned- Before the, we do this, oh, do you go ahead. raise the hand or how are we gonna do it? Um, Topper, I could hardly hear you. If you could, um, since I cannot see everybody at once, if you could use the little um, hand raise thing. Ah, ah, now I have three. I had I had it up there. Okay, well, it just came over. So Mary Beth, James, and then um, Topper. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question about PPE. I know that there were a lot of um, concerns that we, you know, that we don't have enough. And I'm wondering if we're still in that boat, if people and like long-term care facilities, all of these, um, you know, you mentioned the different prioritization of them. I'm wondering if we're able to fulfill all the requests at this point for essential, you know, essential personnel. I, I would, I'm gonna have to defer to the HOC. I'm gonna check on that. I know that we're filling requests on a daily basis. Um, I think that it's fair to say that some folks might request, um, say, a, an, uh, an ambulance squad may say, hey, we need 200 N95 masks, and they may get 70 or 50. Um, and we're trying to refine that process. I know that we've actually asked them for the algorithm or the, what are you using instead of just saying, well, we assume they're asking for more than they need probably. Uh, we don't want stockpiling. And so we're looking at um, methodologies where we can look at what's the typical call volume for a rescue squad and how many should we maybe think about having per call. And so, um, but I'm not, I'm not hearing anymore that requests are going unfilled or even unrecognized. And I do want to say this, we've been working um, to identify um, I have to say, I'm actually very impressed with the amount of creativity and hard thought that has been going in about this particular item is decontaminating N95 masks. And so we've identified a way and we're helping to get some decontamination units into Vermont so we can go around. We're actually pushing language out to all hospitals and providers to not throw their N95s away, to store them safely, we're gonna collect them and we're gonna decontaminate them so that um, we can extend their use. You can only do that so many times, but um, they're like gold right now. And so um, by recycling them uh, through de decontamination, I think we get 20 uses out of them instead of one. Mm. So we're, we're gonna be improving our ability to meet resource demands that way. Just a just a follow up. Has that started happening using that de decontamination system? No, we we're waiting for the machines to arrive, but we've already put the message out to not throw them away. Got it. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, Representative Gregoire, and then Representative McVaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, it probably beating a dead horse, the same as uh, Representative Redmond had for a question is kind of similar. Um, so I was reading an article on Vermont Digger about the nurses union asking for more PPE. Um, and also from, um, 
stories I'm hearing from inside the, the hospitals about, um, you know, basically um, having to wear the same mask for the entire shift to, in and out of uh, different patients' rooms, which normally um, you would take all your gear off after you leave a room or before you leave the room after, and then go into another room fully restocked. Um, so, but then I hear on the other side that we have, we have enough for now. And even the new nurses union said that they have enough for now, but it's a confusing story because I'm hearing two different sides of, have you, have you heard that as well? Or are you on your, at your level, not hearing, um, those two different, very, very different stories of having enough and for now, and then the other side being, no, we really don't. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't had time to read any news outlets. Um, so I don't, I'm not familiar with this story. Um, I'm sure that there are some situations that are like you describe. Um, but I haven't heard them overwhelming. I haven't heard gotten calls from people saying, hey, we're not getting any PPE at all or anything like that. Um, and I know they're fulfilling requests on a regular basis. So, and I'm on the phone every day um, with home health care. It's the same call, home health care and the hospital association in some of the hospitals, um, and I haven't heard, um, everyone's concerned about PPE going forward, but I haven't heard what you described. Thank you. Thank Did you. Did I answer your question? Um, to the best of your ability, I mean, I just, I, I know from the article and, and from all the people I know inside the hospital that um, they feel differently, but if that message isn't getting out or if they just don't understand, so, why you know it's, it's, uh, representative i don't want to give i know we're on youtube but if uh if you call i'll send you an email after with my contact information and we can have an on offline call and i can dig into it roger that thank you um chris i'm going to interject right um here before representative mcfawn so um it in that offer to um Representative Gregoire, um, are you um, saying that it is okay if we contact you? It always is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, nothing's different now. If uh, if you have questions, you know, here's my feeling. I would much rather have the ability to answer the question than have you wonder. Um, okay. And I think is it Julie Tucker has my email address. I believe. Right. Um. Thank you, and um, yeah, I will get I will get some clarity from the speaker, who has um, along with someone from the governor. Oh, so right. They have requested. Which I know what you're fine. saying. Um, but if it is fine with you that um, um, that even I contact you directly, or if it's fine that people on this committee do. But we'll figure that out. But yep, thank that's you. right. I forgot about that process, and that's I didn't mean right. to short circuit that. You no, know, you know, if, if it's um, we'll figure we'll figure that out. But I appreciate your willingness to hear directly, if not from. So that will. No, we'll I, I think it, it's. I think it's important, Madam Chair, that um, we get the best information out there because yep. right now things are moving extremely quick, quickly. Um, what I know this week is a hundred times or a thousand times more than I knew last week. I didn't expect yeah. it. And so sometimes it's hard to know. And I wanna make sure you have all the appropriate information if I can do that to my <laughs> best of my ability. Chris, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, Representative McVaughn and then Representative Haas. Copper's muted. <laughs> 